Okay, so uh, I'll get started. I'm here to talk about an open source project that I've been working on. It's called Base Jump. Um, so Christina already introduced me, but um, here we go. I'm uh, Ryan Paul, and I work for RethinkDB as a developer evangelist. Um, if you've been to some of these meetups, you've probably seen me around. Um, all right, so I think before I jump into what Base Jump is and what it can do for you, um, I, I want to start by talking about the anatomy of an API backend, what's involved when you build a, a REST API. And you know, I, I think about this a lot because I, I build a lot of these demos. And when, when you do the kind of demo building that I do, it's like, you know, it's not like these big involved applications that you maintain for long periods of time. I'm just kind of like churning out these little apps. And I find that I'm doing the same things over and over and over again. And a lot of it is very repetitive and you know, maybe a little bit simplistic even. Um, and I, I started to think about the, the constituent parts that make up an API. Um, you have your, your server, which parses and handles the requests. Then you have routing, um, which is how you, you define your endpoints. Um, and then you have uh, validation. You have some mechanism that sanitizes the input that you're receiving from the users before you, you manipulate it or put it into a database. And then finally, you have the persistence layer, um, which you use to store and retrieve data. So um, this is, you know, like probably oversimplified, you know, top-down view of what an API looks like. But you know, if you're building a lot of API backends, you, you'll find that these are generally the, the the pieces, right? So here's here's a stack diagram. It's just kind of like a real-world RethinkDB application stack that that reflects that structure. Um, and these are just like various components that you might use if you were building a real-world RethinkDB application uh, on Node.js. You know, you have Node itself, then you have an application server like Koa or, or Express, and you have a routing engine on top of that, and you're, you're using something for validation. In this case, I picked Joy. Um, and then all of that exists to power a, a REST API. And on the front end, uh, the client side, You've got your, your browser, you have your front-end framework. In this case, I, I picked Vue, which is a, a framework I commonly use, but you could also do React or Angular, what have you. And then you have some, some mechanism that you use to speak to the REST API, where you're just hitting these endpoints, you're fetching the data, you're caching it or pulling it into your app. And um, I commonly use like the, uh, a polyfill for the, the standards-based uh, HTML5 fetch API, but you know there's there's like Relay and and you know Angular Data and all of this other these other libraries that you can use to to speak with a REST API. So I feel like these are the components on the front end and on the back end that you would use to build a, a you know a, a REST API and, and a you know front end on top of it. So here's like kind of just a more generalized version of that. You know your your runtime, your server, your router, um, the the categories that I described before. Um, so what's the problem with this? You know, where, where, where's the pain point? Um, you end up with a lot of layers between a re when, you when you take your incoming requests and your persistence layer where you're, you're manipulating the data. Um, you end up with a lot more boilerplate than business logic, especially in a simple app when you first start working or when you're prototyping. And uh, you get a lot of repetitive code that's, that's difficult to reuse, it's difficult to abstract out into a uh, into reusable pattern, right? And, and that's the thing, like I'll show you like, like what I'm talking about here. Like this is just a sample endpoint from one of my applications. And you end up writing dozens of these where it's just, okay, here's the path, here's the, your validation, here's you know, throwing an error if it doesn't validate, and then we're just gonna talk to the database and do some database operation and then return a response, right? And so you end up spending a lot of time doing this kind of stuff and there's just a lot of plumbing and boilerplate involved. Um, and this is done with COA, so there's actually not as much boilerplate as there would be if you're doing it with Express, but it's still pretty painful and repetitive. And you know, the, the thing that I get stuck on is that, especially when you're prototyping, like what if I could just shorten that distance? You know, what can I do to abstract away the boilerplate? Because what I really want is just from request to database. I, I, wanna, I wanna shorten the distance between those two points. Um, and and that, was, that was kind of where this idea came from. What I want to do is attach a query to a URL endpoint. And so I built this tool called Base Jump that's designed around this concept. And it is actually uh, a visual tool that allows you to rapidly prototype API backends. Um, it has a, a graphical interface you can access in the browser where you define all of your endpoints and then you associate queries with them. Uh, and it's implemented as a dynamic routing middleware. 
And uh, under the hood, it's powered by a declarative JSON format that describes all of the routes. So before I keep going, you know, this is all kind of a little bit abstract. I want to show you what it actually looks like. So I'm going to do a quick demo here to show you base jump, show you the front end. Okay, so basically it's just a GUI for defining, um, defining your, your routes and um, associating queries with them. So um, let, let's show you a very simple route. I have a, a table in my database um, called uh, fellowship that um, I'll show you the contents here. In, um, in the Data Explorer, there are RethinkDB Data Explorer, just so you can see the, the JSON. It's just all the members of the Fellowship of the Ring from Lord of the Rings, right? So th here it is in the database. And let's say that I want to expose that through a REST API. All I do here is I, I create, I've created a route called Fellowship. So you can see the path slash Fellowship. And uh, it's a GET request. You can specify GET, put, post, or delete. Um, and then here, if there were parameters, which I'll show you later, they would be specified here. And then it's just a query. You know, it does the same, the same query I just did in the Data Explorer. Um, you, it, it accesses the table right into the database. And so because I've defined this in base jump, I can actually um, just hit that endpoint, and it'll show me the results. So let's, let's do this now. Fellowship. So there we go. You see the JSON. Uh, I have a browser plugin that I'm using to just prettyify the JSON a little bit. But um, the... the uh, what you're seeing here is JSON that's served directly out of the database from this routing engine. And it's all dynamic. So let's say I want to add a new route. Um, let me do a new one right now. I'll just create a new route. Um, we'll call it test. We'll make it a get request. And then I'll just do like a simple in place query. Um, you know, you can do the R dot expression. You can put in any value and it'll just return it. So all this will do is return an array that has the values 1, 2, and 3. So now I'm going to I've saved it. So now you can see here we our new get request added in the the base jump user interface. And um, now if I go to slash test, it'll give me that result back. Yeah. So you can see it's pretty simple. Now let's say I wanted to add a parameter. Um, for parameters, you can have a query string, um, a, a body object which you use for like a post request, for example, or a path a path value. So um, I'll show you a query one first. Let's just call one, let's call it like, um, we'll call it x, just to keep things simple. And we'll set it to be a number. We'll specify that the type of this, this parameter is number. OK, so let's, let's use that parameter in the query. Um, let's say that we wanted to iterate over the elements in the array and multiply each one by the number that the person provides in that parameter. So we'll just do a simple r.row.mol um, params.x. So you have this params object that's exposed inside the query. And I'll talk a little bit about how that works later. That gives you access to the, the named parameters that you've defined for your endpoint. So um, did I get that right? Yeah. OK, so let's save that. OK, so I saved it. You can see the change. The change um, here you can see now has the parameter listed. So now let's, let's do that. Let's do x equals 3. Now it multiplied all of them by 3. So now you can easily specify parameters. Now you can also do a, a path, a path property. So, okay, so he, here we have a variant of the um, of the fellowship. Oh, wait, let me find a better um, uh, fellowship species. Okay, so in our fellowship table, um, you can see that each each document we have the name of the character and then their species, what what race they are in Middle Earth. So let's say we wanted to, to be able to let the user filter by species using um, like a, a, uh, a path segment. So we have fellowship slash colon species. The colon Im implies that it's a variable. And then now down here in our parameters, we have a, uh, a parameter that says that it's in the path called species. And that correlates with the, vari with the variable here. So now we'll be able to use whatever they pass after slash fellowship as the, uh, the variable. So you can see here what the query does is it just filters by, um, by species using the, uh, the parameters. So now if I were to go to um, slash, let's do the slash fellowship again. So just plain slash fellowship, it gives us the whole fellowship. But if we do slash hobbit, it passes that parameter into the query and it uses it in the filter command and now you have a filtered view. Um, so that's, that's really the, 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 basic, the basic operation here. Um, you can do all kinds of requests. You can also do post requests, in which case you can pass a JSON body um, to, the, uh, to the query. 
and uh, it, it'll, it'll include the body in the, uh, in the request. Um, you can also do delete operations. So here's a version of that fellowship, um, fellowship query where you can delete a member of the fellowship, and it, it takes uh, a path a path property uh, or path parameter called ID that allows you to specify the document to retrieve that you want to delete. Um, so another thing that you can do is uh, I've added a, a rudimentary view system. So here's one slash view slash fellowship. Down here in this template box, I have a Jade template. Um, and what's going to happen here is it's a two-pass process when you specify a template. What it'll do is it'll perform the query, and then it'll take the result set from that query and pass it into the template with this um, special magic variable called result. So then the template will process it, and you'll get output that's, that's presenting HTML based on the template. So see this template here? It shows an H1 fellowship and then a, a UL, so it's like a bulleted list of all the members. So let's go to that endpoint so you can see it. We'll put um, slash view slash fellowship. And see now you get HTML back. It's actually doing like server-side template rendering in the in the uh, the, the middleware, um, and you can just specify your template directly in the uh, in the route. Um, so that's that's the the basic set of features. Now um, you get a little bit of control over things like the types of the parameters. Okay, so like um, in our test parameter here, our test our test query here, we have this parameter x where it was a number. Obviously, any parameter, any, any input the user provides in either the path or the query is going to be a string, right? Okay, but by specifying type number, we're telling it that we want it to just automatically coerce it into an integer. Um, and so that, that's kind of, kind of a neat feature there. But um, let's say you wanted to actually do validation against input. Like, let's say that you have um, the ability to do, okay, where's a post request? Here's a post request where the user is adding a new member of the fellowship. Um, Th this is just accepts a generic like like um, object as the, the the body and it'll just insert it. But what if you wanted to actually validate and make sure that it has the right properties or whatever? So that's where schema validation comes in. So I have support for using JSON schemas to validate user input. So you can define a schema, and I've got this visual editor for defining a schema. So you can define an object with all of the properties. Um, so like. Like here, here's a person object, and it has age, favorite color, gender, and these are it's an integer, a string, a string, and then uh, location is an object. So you can actually have a nested hierarchy of data that you're validating against, and these are all the properties. So let's say I want to add another property to location, just click the add property, and then I can add a new a new you know property here. It's like that's a string. I can change it to a boolean if I wanted. Um, so yeah, so you can define a whole schema here. And um, this is still a work in, process, th in progress. The schema part isn't completely done yet. But the idea is that um, when you're defining your route and you're setting up uh, like a post request with a body, you'll be able to select a schema from the inputted schemas and say that I want it to validate the input against the schema. So that feature works under the hood. I just haven't finished the UI to expose it yet. The um, uh, schema UI is, is pretty non-trivial. It's taken me a bunch of time to get this right. I'm still working on it. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where it's going. So now under the hood, all of this, this data that you're providing through the UI, it's all stored as JSON, and it's actually stored in the database. Um, so this, this route here with the, you know, these properties, I'll, I'll show you in the database itself, um, it's just JSON documents, API demo table routes. So yeah, so here are our route objects. And you can see the route properties. You can see uh, the action here. The I guess this is an older one. I'm going to try route. There we go. No. Ah, no. Base jump. Sorry, I was using the wrong older version. OK, here we go. Yeah, so um, x action is the, the query. Um, and here are the parameters. So this is our test, our test route. Um, and there's the method, the path the uh, parameter, and then the query, and then if there was a template, it would be here. So you can see it's just storing it in the database. Um, and what it's doing here is kind of neat. It has an in, uh, a routing table in memory, so it's not doing a database query every time you, you hit an endpoint. It has a routing table in memory, and it uses the RethinkDB change feed so that whenever you change the routing in, in the database, whenever you change anything in that route table, it updates the internal in-memory routing table, so it keeps it synchronized. Um, so that that way all of your, your routes are, are in memory and it's very, very fast. It works a lot like any other routing middleware. Um, so, okay, one last thing. Um, 
a lot of this under the hood, you know, like I said, is in uh, JSON, JSON documents in the database, but you can also export um, into a, a format called Swagger. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, in more detail about that later. But you can actually export all of the, you know, the routes and the schemas and all of that into a, like just a standards-based human and computer readable file that you can use. So like for example, the way, the way that I kind of think about this in my head is that you use this user interface when you're rapid, doing rapid prototyping and you're designing your application. And then when you've got all of your routes kind of figured out, then you just export this JSON file and you, you run your application against that JSON file and it's, it's just very light. You don't have the overhead of all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, UI stuff. Um, you know, philosophically, a lot of what I'm what I'm doing here, I, you know, I, with with Base Jump, I believe in this like API first approach to backend development, um, and this is this is kind of the idea where when you're when you're building your application, you start with okay, here's the functionality that I want to expose, and here's how I want to expose it to the user, and then you, everything kind of extends from that. It's very much a like form follows function. You start with your API, and then you build the UI on top of it, and this this concept kind of like became popular a few years ago when, when mobile stuff started really taking off because you know, if you want to be able to build an application that spans across every screen, you really need to be thinking more about like, the, how this functionality will translate to all those environments. And you can't just start with a web application um, because if you want to do mobile and, you know, and all of these other kinds of platforms, you, know, you, you want to have an API that's universally addressable across all of them. So now you can have a web front end, you can have native mobile front ends and all of that, all extending from the same back end. So I like to start with data modeling and start with a, with a back end first, API first approach to development. Um, I'll, I'll contrast that to other approaches. There's a later on in the segment where I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, so under the hood, the way that Base Jump is implemented, what you saw was this you know, fancy user interface. But uh, underneath, there's this layer that I call the base jump router. And the router is actually database agnostic. It's not designed for RethinkDB. Um, although I designed it with RethinkDB in mind, it will work with just about anything. And um, at the end of the day, what it's doing to execute those, the, the code in the handler, you know, the place where I type in that query, what it's doing is it's using Node's VM module to execute that code in a sandbox. So Node.js has this module called VM that lets you like instantiate a isolated V8 context in which you can securely run code. So that's, that's how it's executing that code. And you could put anything in there, any JavaScript code, and it would just run. And uh, what, what the base jump router does is it's this, this system for um, associating the, those blocks of code with, with paths, with the, the endpoints, the routing. Um, so it's implemented just like any other routing middleware, um, you know, like the standard you know, routing middleware packages that you find for COA and Express. And um, because of that, it integrates seamlessly with COA. Um, I'll show you a little bit later what it looks like if you embed it in a COA application, but it really is just like app.use and then, you know, base jump router. Um, it also integrates with Socket.io, which I'll, I'll show you too a little bit later. That was kind of more of an ad hoc integration. Um, but the, uh, the, the JSON data that, it, that, that it's using, the declarative JSON structure that defines these routes, it's based on a standard format called Swagger. Um, so Swagger is kind of a, like the de facto standard, AP, uh, standard for describing APIs. Um, it's very popular for API documentation, actually. Um, what you do with it in a Swagger document um, is you, you describe all of your endpoints, you describe the, the, um, the schema of the, uh, the objects that it can accept and manipulate and return and you define all of the results and things like that. And so it becomes like this very detailed, programmatic and human readable description of your APIs. And um, it's, it's used a lot for tooling. What people will do is they'll, they'll create a, a swagger description of their API and then they'll use that to like generate automated API testing tools or automatic documentation or you know, all sorts of things like that. So it's, it's very common for these kinds of tasks. And when I started building this, um, and, I, and I decided that everything was going to be these like declarative JSON documents, it felt kind of natural to start using the Swagger format. Now, there, it wasn't perfect a perfect mapping. Um, there were problems with Swagger, and I might move off of it. The, one of the things that, do, that I don't like about it is that it's very, um, it's very strict. It requires things that you don't necessarily want to have you know, in, in Basejump. 
Um, so, okay, so it's, the Swagger is designed to be extensible. It has these like um, uh, vendor properties. You can add your own custom properties to Swagger. So I've added sp uh, specific base jump specific properties to Swagger. And so I figured like doing this like super set of Swagger would be good enough. But Swagger requires you to do things like um, provide schemas for result types, which you know is not necessarily something that you want to have out of the box when you're prototyping your app. It, it's it's just like it's just like something that you would m maybe want to have at some point, but not right away. And it's very strict about it. And so, like the Swagger files that I generate don't necessarily work with all of the other tooling. So I've been thinking more about moving to something that isn't explicitly Swagger, and then having import and export uh, with a format. But it, what I've done is very close to Swagger, and it's heavily influenced by it. Um, Swagger can be in YAML or JSON, and I support both in Base Jump. Um, so you've seen the um, you know the UI layer here, but you can actually just write a plain old Swagger file that has those X action vendor properties, and and you can pass it into the Swagger router, and it'll work. Um, it, Swagger uses JSON schema for validation, so it's like actually like built into Swagger that they the support for JSON schema. Um, I'm using a JSON schema library called AJV, um, which um, works pretty well for my needs. Um, but yeah, it, it meshes really well with the, the whole Swagger ethos. Um, yeah, so here's what a Swagger file looks like. What you're seeing here is um, a few simple routes. You're seeing a, a slash test route with get and post operations. And you can see that I've got that X action vendor property where I've put the, uh, the query. And you can actually write this by hand. It's, I mean, it's fairly painless to write by hand, even if you didn't want to use the UI. Um, Okay, so now I want to talk briefly about embedding base jump in your own node application. Okay, so um, I mentioned that I use the um, the VM module to execute the the code. So if you look at the the um, the, the code that I'm I'm passing in, in 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 you know any of these examples, you see that we have R, which is the you know the standard rethink DB module, right? Okay, well when you embed base jump into your own node application, you can pass in anything that you want. Um, so I happen to pass in R, but let's say that you wanted to use Mongo or whatever, you could actually pass in Mongoose. Um, so the, the API that I provide for, for embedding base jump will let you pass in custom objects. Um, so you can provide any functionality you want, like say there there's some utility functions that you want to be able to use in those handlers, you can add it, whatever you want. Um, all right, so you can also um, inherit and override the request processing. So in the like internal base jump API, I have a, a class called request handler that does all of the underlying logic for processing a request. And if you wanted to like change fundamentally change the behavior, like um, how it how it's executing the code or um, change the way that it does validation or any of those things, you can just you can just import that request handler class. You can subclass it and you can override any of its properties. Um, that will also expose to you um, the, uh, the the route table and the schema table and all those other things. So you can you can also um, you can also take the entire like route management system and you can override it too. So there's a lot of customization that you can do programmatically if you import base jump into your own Node app. Um, you can you can also easily add custom pre and post processing on the input and output. Like say that you wanted to just have a like some code that you're that you're using to manipulate the the input the json input before you send it to the database before it it touches that query or whatever you could you could add that too so just to give you an idea how easy it is to embed base jump um, here's just a very simple example where i'm taking the um, base jump router middleware and embedding it in koa and then passing it rethink db uh, you can see the the context context property is where I, you pass in the uh, the other variables that are other objects that you want to have available during the uh, like query execution, and in this case, I'm just passing in R, the the rethink DB module. Um, so yeah, you can you can embed it in a normal Koa application, and then you can do any other thing that you would do in Koa. So you can see here, I'm using other Koa middleware like uh, uh, cores, like I wanted cross origin handling, uh, request handling, because I wanted to be able to you know like like um, use uh, a, sa a sample web application from my file system, like in the browser from the file system, and have it access the server, so I enabled cores. You could use any other middleware. You can even manually define additional routes 
So, you know, if you have an existing COA application where you have a bunch of manually defined routes, you can still embed base jump into it and it'll just add the additional routes. Okay, so um, I want to talk briefly about where I'm going with this. Um, this is, it is an open source project. The, um, the UI is still under development. I haven't released that yet. The underlying router is in my GitHub account. Um, I'll, I'll have a repo for that and I'll give you the address for that at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you wanted to, you could, you could um, start using it today. Um, however, it's really not ready for adoption quite yet. The uh, API, internal API and data format are still subject to change. Um, as I mentioned, I, I'm, I am thinking about moving to my own, my own format instead of Swagger. Um, and so that'll be a pretty radical change. And I think that some of the other new features I want to add might also compel me to make some more changes to the data format. So I think until the, like, the actual underlying data format stabilizes, it's probably not the greatest idea to start using this yet. But um, I will do a blog post you know, on the RethinkDB blog at some point in the future when, um, when I get to the point where I'm ready to release it and it's stable for people to use. Um, so feature roadmap. Um, right now you can embed it very easily in Koa. And I've got this really clean abstraction layer that makes it easy to embed into just about anything. So um, it'll be very easy to make it also support Express. I don't use Express. I really mostly use Koa. So that's why I started with Koa. But it'll be very easy to add Express support. So I'm going to do that for anybody who wants it. Um, I'm also working on, as you saw from the UI, interactive schema editing. Um, I'm also going to do a pluggable view system. So when I showed you the, the template, the HTML template and the server-side rendering, um, it was just like a Jade snippet that was attached to the route, and that's very limiting. So what I want to do is add an actual pluggable template system um, so that you can use any template engine that you want, not just Jade. And so that the, the other thing, too, is that when you have the, like, just snippet, that Jade snippet, you can't do, like, includes and things like that. So I want to make it easy to do includes and, and you know, more broader template stuff for server-side templating. Um, okay, so also route collections and blueprints. Um, so you saw that, you know, you can easily add a single route one at a time, and it's very easy to do that. But one of the concepts that I'm playing with is the idea of um, having these groups of routes that you can add based on a schema. So um, let's say you define a, a certain object type and you want to be able to have just standard CRUD routes for that object type. You could have a what I call a blueprint, which is sort of like a template of standard routes where the schema is, is uh, like passed in like a function or passed in like an argument. Um, so, so you could have like different kinds, of different kinds of standard routes and then you can automatically generate them for a given a given schema, that's a, it's a little complicated, but when it when it's done, it'll be very much like the the, the concept of the the CRUD blueprints from um, SalesJS. That's kind of what that's modeled after. And the idea here is that like I want to be able to take a schema and say, okay, give me you know uh, an insert, delete, and filter whatever routes on it without me having to manually write those routes. Um, so that that's the uh, route collections and blueprints concept. Uh, also, I want to add authentication and user management. Um, there's a specific reason I haven't yet that I'll get into shortly. Um, the other thing I want to add is live API debugging. So um, API debugging, what I mean by that is um, when you're creating your route, I want to be able to say, okay, here's a set of sample values for all of these parameters. Just hit the endpoint and show me what I would get in return. That way you can iterate very quickly and you can, you can see the JSON right in the UI and not have to use some like external tool to hit the endpoints. It's especially painful. Like like I can hit those get endpoints in the browser, but if you're testing a post endpoint, then you I mean you have to pull out curl at the command line or, or postman or some other tool. I want to make it so it's all just built into the UI. So live API debugging is a big one. Um, all right. So the those those things I just discussed are things on the like near term roadmap. In terms of far future, there are a lot of things that you that I could do with this that I've been kind of mulling over in my head. And I, I really get excited about how, how much power you can derive from having all of these, all of these routes and, and schemas and things in these declarative JSON formats that are all machine readable. Like your entire API and everything that contributes to it is, is programmatically accessible. There's so many cool things you can do with that. And like a big one is to automatically generate client libraries. Um, so you can generate a client library that just wraps the whole API and gives you just a really nice, 
nice set of methods or functions or whatever for hitting all of the endpoints. Um, another one that I've been playing with a lot is uh, using schemas to generate input forms. So you know we know the types of all of these properties, right? What if we can say, okay, it's a it, it's a it's a date or date or time, you know, show a date field, you know, if it's a text a string, show a text box, and actually generate an input form for editing the data and generate that automatically from the schema. So in addition to being able to set up the routes and all that, you'd also be able to, in the base jump UI, browse your data and edit it with neatly tailored form fields. All right, so another big one that I've been thinking a lot about is um, support for file uploading and, and multi-part MIME. Um, I, I want to be able to make it so that uh, you have a, an endpoint that allows you to upload files. You know, like if you're doing a photo blog, for example, you want to be able to upload, upload an image. And um, I want to make it so that it's really, really easy for Base Jump itself to just like bounce that over to S3, right? Um, so you know you can and then and then like store the URL in the database and things like that. So a few features like that that I'm playing with. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so the yeah the last one is um, that. Um, oh wait, let me go back. Okay, I'll, I'll want to generate tables and indexes from schemas. Um, that's a big one. Right now you have to manually create all of your tables. But um, we have all of these properties, and we could theoretically know which ones the user wants to query against, right, um, based on what we're exposing in the API. So what if we could create indexes from the schemas? So that's another thing I'm thinking about. All right, so a big question for those of you who have been to our recent meetups, how does this thing compare to Fusion? So um, Fusion, for those of you who don't know, is a, a project that we've been working on for some time now. Um, where we want to extend RethinkDB into the browser. We want to make a, a really rich client-side developer experience for, for building real-time applications with RethinkDB. And it gives you a requel-like query language that you can use on the front end. Um, so we've been working on this project, and it's, you know, I think we're probably about a month, maybe two months out from being able to share it with the world. Um, we've been calling it Project Fusion up to this point, but um, we actually recently rebranded um, it's it's going to be called uh, Horizon. So yeah, so um, Horizon is is going to be a really great thing for developers who are building RethinkDB apps without writing wanting to write their own backend. So of course, what I'm doing with Base Jump is also RethinkDB without writing backend code, right? So um, so what what's the difference? I wanted to talk about that. Um, Base Jump, like I said, I have this emphasis on a backend first approach to development. And I'm focused on REST APIs. I do have Socket IO support, which I'll show you later on. But it, you know, Base Jump is really just about REST APIs, and it, it's a back-end first approach. Horizon is very much a front-end first approach. What, one of the things that's really exciting about Horizon is that there's like virtually no setup. Um, it does create your tables and your indexes automatically, and you, you don't have to think about your data model at all. When you build an app with Horizon, you just start building your front-end experience, and you have this like persistence layer that's just there for you, right? Whereas with Base Jump, you start by defining your data model. You create your routes, you create your schemas. So it's very much approaching things from different sides. And I think that it's useful to be able to do that, go both ways. Um, so also, Horizon emphasizes web sockets. You know, it's all it's all real time, whereas Base Jump is REST APIs. So those are the differences. But the the real exciting thing is what we can get by converging the two approaches. So um, Horizon is very easy to embed, and Base Jump is very easy to embed. So you can actually use both in the same Node application. So I, I didn't I didn't want to share it tonight because you know Horizon is still a little ways out. But I have built a demo where um, I've taken and exposed all of those base jump routes that are dynamically created in the UI through a Horizon custom endpoint. So in Horizon, we have this concept of custom endpoints where you can add special commands to the real-time API. So um, it, it will be possible to use Horizon and base jump together. So now this, this brings up a point I mentioned earlier, the reason I haven't actually done user accounts or authentication for base jump yet, it's because I'm waiting to see how it's done in Horizon, and we're actually adding some features to the database itself in order to accommodate this in Horizon, um, you know, proper access control and things like that. So I kind of want to make sure that what I do in Base Jump is compatible with what the Horizon team is working on. I want to make it so it can use the same authentication layer. Okay, so yeah, I think that there's, uh, I think the two of them together will give you a great experience where you get that like like instant low friction real time, and you get 
you know, backend uh, REST APIs and, and, and uh, endpoints and things like that. Okay, so um, here are some resources for you, RethinkDB website, and then the middle one is the important one there. That's the GitHub repository where I've got the uh, base jump router. So if you go to that repository today, you can see the current version of the base jump router and you can try it out. And um, there's a, a directory in there called examples that has just some simple, simple examples of how you can embed base jump router in a node application. And one of them is just like reading from a YAML file and one of them is using routes from a database. So you can see both approaches. Um, and then finally, the last one is just my Twitter handle if you want to follow me for, for more details. But um, before I wrap up, I'll, I'll just show you, um, I promise to show you the real time in base jump, which is really more of a toy than anything else, but uh, it, it's kind of fun to share. Um, let's see if this works. I ha actually haven't tested this recently. Um, so the, um, the, the base jump server has a socket IO um, instance that it's, uh, it's attaching, um, and it exposes all of the base jump routes that you've defined in the routing table over socket IO. Um, so let's see if uh, is it going to work? It might not work. Yep. Okay. So now we've got. Um, let's do a get request on that fellowship endpoint, and uh, it just returns a promise. So I'll do uh, then x console dot log x. Okay. So let's see. It should give you the members of the fellowship, and there you go. So yeah, there you go, using socket IO to, uh, to hit one of those endpoints. And it has methods, so you can do um, dot post, dot delete, whatever. You do have to type the, the path segment into, the, uh, into the, uh, the method name there. But yeah, so that's, that's real time. And um, the, the integration I had with Fusion looks somewhat similar. Um, so yeah, it is really easy to take these, these uh, endpoints and expose them over anything you want, really. Um, because it's it's all you know you can take the, the underlying logic for the uh, the routing and the the query processing and and you can do whatever you want with it, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's that's base jump, um, and um, I'll hopefully be open sourcing the UI soon. The UI is not open source yet, um, just the router. Um, I'm still working on some final details in the UI. I think when I get the schema stuff done, I'll be I'll be releasing it. Okay. Um, any questions?